The committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Today, the Committee on Oversight and Reform is holding its second hearing on the January 6th insurrection. As we examine the events of that day, we must keep at the forefront that January 6th was the deadly culmination of weeks of increasingly desperate efforts by former President Trump to prevent the peaceful transfer of power and overturn the lawful results of the 2020 presidential election. Just this morning, the committee released documents we obtained showing that in the weeks leading up to January 6 attack, President Trump repeatedly pressured the Department of Justice to overturn the election he had lost. President Trump sent bogus election fraud claims to Jeffrey Rosen just minutes before he announced on Twitter that he was appointing Mr. Rosen as acting attorney general. When that didn't work, President Trump used official White House channels and a private attorney to pressure DOJ to file a lawsuit in the Supreme Court to nullify the election, but only in states he lost. When the department refused, President Trump attempted to replace Mr. Rosen with another DOJ official who appeared willing to embrace these conspiracy theories and further the president's corrupt ends. In an email released by the committee, one DOJ official called the conspiracy theories pushed by the White House, quote, pure insanity, end quote. After his efforts to pressure the Department of Justice failed, President Trump grew even more desperate. And so on the morning of January 6, he sent an angry, violent mob to the Capitol. The goal was to use violence to stop Congress from certifying that Joe Biden won the election. In other words, Donald Trump was a attempting to instigate a coup or to use his own words as he gave literal marching orders that morning, President Trump wanted the rioters to, quote, walk down to the Capitol, fight like hell, stop the steal, end quote. And the rioters responded. They marched to the Capitol, forced their way inside, violently attacked the police, and put the lives of the Vice President, members of Congress, and their staff in grave danger. Thanks to the bravery of our law enforcement, including the U.S. Capitol Police and D.C.'s Metropolitan Police Department, the mob was defeated and Congress certified the results of a free and fair election. But make no mistake, the men and women on the front lines of that battle faced terrible odds on January 6. They were beaten, bludgeoned, and pepper sprayed. Many officers from the Capitol Police lacked the equipment and proper training to confront such a violent mob, and others felt they did not receive the instructions and support from superiors that they needed as conditions deteriorated. Is the chairwoman muted? No. Last I week, in consultation with Ranking Member Comer, the committee invited the acting chief of the Capitol Police, Yogananda Pittman, to testify today about these challenges. I am very disappointed that Chief Pittman has declined to appear today. However, she has committed to testify, and I can announce today that she will appear before this committee on July 21st. The Capitol Police were gravely unprepared on January 6th, but they could not be expected to repel the worst attack on the Capitol in 200 years on their own. Unfortunately, our committee's investigation has revealed that the federal government failed to sound the alarm before January 6 and was slow to respond once the attack occurred. Today, we are joined by three witness, witnesses who can shed light on those failures. First, we are joined by FBI Director Christopher Wray. 
The FBI is our nation's leading law enforcement agency and is tasked with preventing domestic terrorism. In the weeks before January 6, online forums erupted with threats of violence against lawmakers and the Capitol. One FBI field office warned that violent extremists were preparing for, quote, war, end quote. Yet the FBI failed to use all of its tools to warn of the looming assault. It did not use or issue a formal intelligence bulletin about the threat, and it did not pass on key intelligence to the leaders of the Capitol Police. Five months after the attack, we still do not have the full story of these failures because the FBI and Department of Justice have not fully cooperated with this committee's investigation. This delay is unacceptable and it makes us more vulnerable to yet another attack. Today, we also welcome General Charles Flynn and Lieutenant General Walter Pyatt, who worked on the Army staff on January 6. Neither of these career military officers was in the direct chain of command on January 6, but they both participated in key discussions about how the National Guard should respond. That response took far too long. Documents obtained by the committee show that beginning at 1.30 p.m., top officials at the Defense Department received at least 12 urgent requests for help from the Capitol Police, the mayor, and other officials. But after a series of delays, the National Guard did not arrive until 5.20 p.m., more than four hours after the Capitol perimeter was breached. This is a shocking failure, and today we intend to get to the bottom of why it happened. At our last hearing, I was deeply dismayed that some of my Republican colleagues denied basic truths about that day. So let's be clear. The attack was an insurrection. It was not a peaceful protest or a normal tourist visit. It was an insurrection. You don't have to take my word for it. The top Republicans in Congress, Senate Minority Leader McConnell and Republican Leader McCarthy, have both acknowledged that the events of January 6 were, quote, an insurrection, end quote. As the next step in our investigation, the committee has requested transcribed interviews with former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, who directly pressured DOJ officials at least five times to investigate false claims of election fraud. We also plan to interview former Acting Attorney General Jeffrey Rosen and other senior officials with firsthand knowledge of President Trump's campaign to overturn the 2020 election. We must never forget the horrific events we witnessed in January or dishonor those who risk their lives to protect ours. This committee will continue to fulfill its duty and investigate the attack on January 6 with every means at its disposal. Before I conclude, I would like to play a short video to remind everyone of exactly what transpired on that day. Please play the video.
They should be with us. Director Ray, you are now recognized for your testimony. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20 hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it? According to investigators, they insist he was intentionally targeting white military looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black on white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals, no matter what color they are? When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. Yeah. You know, you look at January 6th. Everybody has said it was a tragic day. It never should have yep. happened. They wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson. He looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that. And you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, that. last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, that, that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, that, where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. <laughs> and I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past 
racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that January 6th is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for, to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage up, across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people. Right. And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be, uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy, is, is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown, and I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that is, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has, has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure it does in certain areas. But is the, is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.